the book of Amos is, is a tremendous, tremendous blessing because of the theme, is, uh, as I'm going to share with you, is, is so replete with meaning. It's prepare to meet your God. And especially, I want to show you in chapter 4, a couple of items. You might want to even mark them because these are valuable for a lifetime. The first one is in uh, verse 11. This is uh, one of those great Trinity verses. And I always like to show people those Trinity verses that talk about God uh, being uh, one God but in more than one person. And we know in the Scriptures he's in three persons. But verse 11, it says, I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I, the Lord, have overthrown you like God overthrew you. Uh, isn't it interesting that, that the Lord and God, uh, it, this is most likely Christ speaking. This is uh, Amos 4 and verse 11. Amos 4 and verse 11. And, and whenever you find God talking to himself, that's one of the evidences of uh, the inter-Trinitarian discussion. Um, but now, especially in verse 12 and 13, I want to uh, show you the, the real theme of this book. And uh, then we'll explain it more deeply. It says in verse 12, Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because, because I shall do this to you. And here's the theme of the book. Prepare to meet your God. Now, if our culture and if our neighbors and if our family members and if we ourselves uh, would just heed this, that we would live in constant preparedness to meet God. Back in the old days, some of you remember the Cold War, and I had a brother-in-law in the Air Force, and he worked on a SAC base, remember, Strategic Air Command, and they spent all their time in constant readiness for whatever was going to happen. And, you know, that, that preparedness was, was a, a great toll. It cost a lot of money. It cost a lot of hours. It cost a lot of uh, crashed airplanes because they kept a lot of them in the air at all times. And they always had the, they were ready for, for a deterrent to an attack. Well, the Lord says we also should live in constant preparedness, only it doesn't have a toll on anything except our humanness and our flesh. Then verse 13, who are we supposed to be preparing for? For behold, verse 13, he who forms mountains, creates winds, and declares to man what are his thoughts. That's who we're supposed to get ready to meet. He who makes the dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord of hosts is his name. What, what a beautiful verse. Uh, that one's in, underlined and, and uh, colored in and everything else. But look at verse 8 of chapter 5, the same, the same uh, truth. He who made the Pleiades and Orion, two of the well-known uh, constellations in the sky, he changes deep darkness into morning. Next time you think you're in the dark and everything's going wrong, God can change the deep darkness into morning. He does it every day. Who darkens the day into night. I mean, remember, just because things are going great, it can, it can be uh, eclipsed quickly, but just trust in the Lord. He calls for the waters of the sea. He pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name, and how wonderful. And then one last one is in uh, chapter 9, chapter 9 and verse 6. The last time he says this, uh, this concept, and uh, he says, The one who builds the upper chambers in the heavens, he has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. He calls for the waters of the sea. He pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Are you ready to meet him? Let's talk about that as we go back to chapter 1. No, I'm not a prophet. No, I'm not even the son of a prophet. It's true. I'm just a fruit picker and a flock tender. That's the way one man describes this book. But I'll tell you something. Even though a lowly layman, I'm far more qualified to speak for God than you, a professional priest. This little confrontation took place around 760 B.C. in the northern kingdom city of Bethel. Now, you remember Bethel when Jeroboam uh, took over the, the northern kingdom, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, too harsh, and he said, I'll beat you with scorpions, and the people rebelled, and, and his head of his workforce was stoned, and he fled for his life, and, and the nation of uh, the United Nation of Israel was split into two pieces: the southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and the northern the rest, the ten. And the northern kingdom was king was uh, governed by a fellow named Jeroboam. He was an adversary God raised up to Rehoboam. Uh, 
And this fella set up in the city of Bethel, which means house of God, it became the house of an idol. It became the golden uh, calf images that are the idolatrous images that Jeroboam set up, one in the north in Dan, one in the south in Bethel of the northern kingdom. So there was a priest there, and Amos came and told him what the Lord thought of that. The speaker was Amos, and his angry listener, Amaziah, the faithless priest of Bethel, who had had apostatized from God and was following this, this cult of Jeroboam. But before he finished, Jews, Gentiles, laymen, and leaders were boldly denounced. Justice had been spurned, judgment would fall. Four terrible visions spoke of this, but after the fury of the storm had abated, the glory of the Lord would appear, Israel would be redeemed, regathered, and restored to the land. This book is so critical because in the book we find, and this is what I'm going to show you, number one, that God does not forget about sin. And I'll show you that. Even though it looks like it, like right now, maybe in our country, it seems like, oh, what happened? You know, we're, why isn't God doing something? Secondly, God in his time will judge sin. And finally, this book teaches that when God is through with our age, with the church, he will return and raise up the Jews and rebuild David's tabernacle. That is quoted. 9-11 is quoted in, in James, the brother of our Lord's sermon in Acts 15, when he says, I will return again and rebuild. And he quotes from this promise to Israel, I will rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David, its walls and its breaches. And he says, I'll do that after I'm through calling the Gentiles to myself. So this is a wonderful book, a wonderful book of promises. But let's keep going. Because Amos, continuing reading your, your study sheet, prophesies during a period of national optimism in Israel. Business is booming. Boundaries are bulging. I mean, everything. They had more land than they'd ever had. They had more commerce. They were astride the great trade routes. They were making all kinds of money. But below the surface, greed and injustice are festering. Hypocritical religious motions have replaced true worship, creating a false sense of security and a growing callousness to God's disciplining hand. Famine, drought, plagues, death, destruction, nothing can force the people to their knees. Amos, the farmer turned prophet, lashes out at sin unflinchingly, trying to visualize the nearness of God's judgment and mobilize the nation to repentance. The nation, like a basket of rotting fruit, stands ripe for judgment because of its hypocrisy and spiritual indifference. Of course, the name Amos means burden bearer. And Amos lives up to the meaning of his name by bearing under his divinely given burden that the Lord gave him to the children of Israel. Well, I would like to read to you what James Montgomery Boyce said, and, and uh, those previous words uh, Harold Wilmington wrote, but James Montgomery Boyce wrote these words, and he said, The church's neglect of Amos, and he's a pastor of first pres, uh, or 10th Pres in Philadelphia, a tremendous pastor, uh, but the church's neglect of the book of Amos might be understandable if we lived in a world of little injustice or of little poverty or of little misuse of wealth, or even if we lived in a world in which the conditions Amos speaks of were recognized but were gradually being righted. But this is not the case. In the last decade, the National Academy of Science published a report saying that 750 million people of the poorest nations on our planet live in extreme poverty with incomes of less than $75 a year. A year. Most of us, uh, our watch or our wedding ring or our glasses cost a lot more than that. That's their annual income. The United Nations Development Forum said that in uh, 20 years ago, at least 460 million people are actually living in starvation. They're actually, their body is depleting. They're not taking enough food and their body is actually depleting and cannibalizing itself because of their starvation. Roughly a billion persons, chiefly in third and fourth world countries, are malnourished. That, I mean, 460 million are starving and a billion are, are undernourished and it's ruining their level of health and, and their condition of living. Yet in spite of all the efforts to deal with such great problems by different groups, the gap between the rich and poor countries is widening each year. By the year 2000, the gross national product of the rich will be 15 times the gross national product of the poor. Well... That only to say this, that our times are so parallel to Amos's that it's a little eerie. And I think we should think about what God speaks about that is wrong with these people and with their callousness. Well, let's look at the character of God briefly. 
And this book is rich in, in the character of God. God's omnipotence is talked about in Amos 4.13. It says, He that formeth the mountains, createth the winds, I already read it. He declares unto man his thoughts. That's the omnipotent God, and that's the character of God. He's also omniscient in Amos 8.7. The Lord has sworn uh, by the excellency of Jacob, I will never forget any of their works. He knows everything. He forgets nothing except by choice. And remember, he, he chooses to forgive our sins when they're underneath the blood of Christ. Thirdly, he is omnipresent. Look at Amos 9 if you'd like to follow along. And it's nice if you... Uh, a byproduct of this study is I usually point out the attributes of God. If you write them off uh, a little note about them in the margin, when you're at a prayer meeting and, and sometimes you're praying from the Scripture, if you have those little notes and arrows, you can find them because it's neat to be able to pray rejoicing in the omnipotent God, in our God who knows all things, in our God who is everywhere present. And if you note those, those are part of the eternal character of God. But chapter 9 says this, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the doors, that the post may shake. Cut them, and he that fleeth them shall not flee away. Verse 2, Though they dig into hell, hence shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence I will bring them down. If they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I'll search it and take them out. I will go, verse 4, uh, Though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence I will command the sword. It shall slay them. I will set my eye on them for evil and not for good. He says, you can't get away from me. Anywhere. Now, how close our culture is to this. Do you remember in the last 40, 50 years, the, the hunt for the Nazi war criminals, and they'd hide in Argentina and nobody would find them, or they'd hide off in, in some South American uh, place that they secreted their money? and hid it away, God says, you might hide from you know, the, the Jewish Holocaust Commission. You might hide from the Federal Bureau or Interpol, but he says, you don't hide from me. He says, I know right where you are. Uh, fourthly, his holiness is in 2.7. His holy name, Amos 4.2, the Lord has sworn by his holiness. He is a jealous God in chapter 4. He says, I am jealous. He says, I want you to, to offer to me that the offerings I expect, he is a just God in Amos 1, 3 through 13, and he talks about the fact that he is counting, and we'll see this in just a minute. God counts the transgressions of the unrighteous. I mean, he goes, uh-huh, that's one, uh-huh, that's two, uh-huh, that's three, and, and it's, it's, he's so patient, and he has already determined when he will settle the accounts. He's a God of justice. No one gets away with anything. He's a God of justice. He's also a God of mercy, and that's Amos 4 and verse 1. And he talks about that. He says, uh, Hear this, you kind of Bashan who are in the mountains, which oppress the poor. He says, I am a merciful God. He says, My heart is, is grieved when you oppress the weak, the poor. He's a merciful God. He's a truthful God, Amos 1, 9. He says, I, I don't like it that you break your covenants. He says, I, I like truth. He's a long-suffering God. But there are also titles of God, and that's on your next page on the inside that I'd like to point out to you. In this book, he is revealed as creator. And, and that's one of the, uh, if you ever want to do a neat study in the Bible, look at how often and how many books the concept of God as creator comes up. It's not just Genesis. It's all the way through. He very much wants to emphasize the fact. And in Amos 4.13, he says, I am the one that formed the mountains. I just spoke with a scientist uh, uh, that, that heard on the radio the, the little thing I did about the Bible. And he says, you know what? He says, the only thing that troubles me is, he says, are the upthrust. He said, how do you account for that? And I said, well, it says in the Bible that the Lord pushed up the mountains. And, you know, to a scientist, they, the Lord pushed up the mountains? Yeah, he says, God said it right here in another way. He says, I formed the mountains. He says, I'm the creator. He's also the revealer in chapter 2, verse 11. I raised up of your sons for prophets. God says, I want to reveal myself so much I have raised up people right in your own midst that will speak for me. I want you to know me. He's a God who wants to reveal himself. He's a sustainer. He said in chapter 5 and verse 8 that he is the one that, that can make the day night. He calls for the water. He is the one that can sustain all the natural world. In fact, uh, it's a little clear in Colossians. It says, by him all things consist. He's the sustainer. He's the one that holds things together. And he says, if I can hold together the incredible forces of the universe, I can sustain you, no matter what you're going through. He's the restorer. 
Uh, this is a verse I referred to from James's sermon in uh, Amos 9.11. I will raise up the tabernacle of David that's fallen. I will close the breaches. He says, I'm going to restore to their rightful place my people in the last day. He is also the Almighty. It says in Amos 5.16, Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of hosts, the Almighty God, the, the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of the armies, this is an amazing name. He is all-powerful. Remember, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians. Just like that. And you know what? There wasn't any blood. There was no radiation. He just, they were dead. It says when they woke up, when the commander woke up in the morning, they were dead. If one angel can kill 185,000, and he has countless angels, just the ones that always stand in front of his throne, Daniel says, there are hundreds of millions of them that do nothing but just stand in front of his throne. Hundreds of millions. Plus he has them all over the universe. He has ministering spirits all over. It says, are they not all ministering spirits, ministering for those who shall be heirs of salvation? Every person on this planet that God is drawing to himself, there are ministering spirits watching over them and protecting them and, and, and guiding and, and, and helping them in the process. So there are countless, just myriads of angels, and he is the Almighty One. And if one of them can do that much, just think the power composite, and of course God's power is so much more. Let's look at the book of Amos uh, like you would if you were in class. Okay, Let me just go through the, the main items. First of all, the writer of this book was Amos. The name means to bear a burden or a burden bearer. He was reared in Tekoa. Now, I, I pastored in Tekoa, Georgia. This is Tekoa, Israel. And it's uh, approximately six miles south of Bethlehem, about 18 miles from the Dead Sea, south of Jerusalem, south of Bethlehem. He was a shepherd or a sheep breeder. He also gathered sycamore fruit, and he was a rugged, out-of-doors type of man, uh, a little different than the society of Israel. And unlike Hosea, Amos presented a straightforward message of political and spiritual justice to the political and spiritual leadership of Israel. The recipients of this letter, although Amos lived in the south, he walked to the north to give the message. Now, can you imagine that? I mean, that height of insult. They knew he was from the south, and he, come, he has the audacity to come to the north. It, it'd be like in the Civil War or pre-Civil War days for a southern preacher to come up and preach in the north about, you know, the, the virtues of slavery. Can you imagine the, uh, you know, they... They would, they would tar and feather him. Well, here comes Amos from the south, from the goody two-shoes, followers of Jehovah, and he goes up to the calf worshipers and tells them what they're doing wrong. And, uh, but he also didn't neglect. He spoke to the southern kingdom and also to the nations around. The background, this event took place in the 8th century. King Uzziah in Judah and King Jeroboam II are in Israel. They're both... Uh, in, in a time of great prosperity. And here's the background. It says in chapter 3 that there was an upper-class society. It used to be that there was the king and the peasants. That's how it was. But in this time, there had emerged a upper-middle and upper-class society. How do we know that? Because they build expensive homes, 315 and 511 and 64 and 611. They had a very carnal lifestyle, chapter 6 says. They exploited the poor in chapter 2, 5, and 10. Uh, or 2, 5, 6, and 8. There was political corruption. There was a lot of this bribery going on in chapter 3, 9, and 10. There was a lot of religious fervor, but there was no true devotion to God. How do we know that? Because the merchants did not observe the Sabbath. Well, they did observe the Sabbath, new moon, and feast days, but it didn't keep them from being dishonest. And they complained they had to close their stores on the religious days. So what it was was kind of an empty, shallow externalism of religiosity, but there was no transformed heart, chapter 8, verses 4 through 6 say. When was this book written? About the year 760. What is the theme? The theme of this book is judgment will come on Israel. Prepare to meet your God. If you're not prepared, you're doomed. Well, let's uh, look at the judgment of God. And if you want to follow along, these are neat little sections. Chapter 1, starting in 3 through 5, is his first pointed indictment. And he goes through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of these in a row. And so if you'd like to kind of mark them off, I'll point them out to you one at a time. But what happens is uh, the nations around Israel were piling up 
disobedience against God. The first one is Syria in 1, 3 to 5. And God says, Damascus will be judged for her ghastly deeds. What did they do? Verse 3, they threshed Gilead with instruments of iron. Now, uh, for those with weak stomachs, don't listen too closely. But they had done it, uh, this in a barbaric and brutal way. It was normal to conquer people back then, but the way they did it was bad. And here's what they did. They took the captives of Gilead, that's uh, up in the northeast corner of this area, and they laid them on the ground and they took a threshing machine that had long, sharp teeth on the underside, which was used to, to separate the grain. And they would, they would, it's kind of like our combines. And they had these long things and they just pull them on sleds through the fields and it would crush the grain. It would get it everything like the, it, it would take the, the kernels and, and rough them up. And then they'd go through and then they'd throw it up in the air and, and all the chaff would blow away and they'd have the grain. They took that machine and they shredded the individuals up. They just laid them down and shredded them all up on the ground. Well, King Hazel's repulsive act would result in the total destruction of Damascus. First, his palace, verse 4, would be burned to the ground. Secondly, the bar on the city gates, verse 5, would be destroyed. And thirdly, the inhabitants from the plain of Avon, uh, which is modern-day Baalbek, uh, which is in the Bekaa Valley, would be cut off. And the plush summer palace, verse 5, would be destroyed. And so all those things God said, I'm going to do because you were so cruel. Number one, what is God looking for in the world? He's looking for cruelty. And I wrote right next to Syria, cruelty on my sheet. And I wrote it in my Bible too, that God is watching for cruelty. Now, is there cruelty going on in our world today? You better believe it. I mean, some of the atrocities in, in some of the Argentine... Uh, uh, inquisition going on in the last decade or two. Uh, it's been reported that they would take political prisoners, put them in airplanes, fly them to 10,000 feet, open the doors, and just dump them out over the ocean and just let them fall to the ocean to their death. That's just part of some of the stuff going on. That's just one country. It's all over the world. God says, don't worry about that. He says, I'm keeping track of the cruelty. Not one cruel act escapes my notice. And he says, for, for three, look at verse three, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four. That is a Hebraism for saying, that's it. You're not going to do any more. That's it. And God says, for three, for four, I've kept track and you aren't going to get away. Number two, the second country denounced is Philistia. That's in verses six through eight. The major cities, Gaza was the capital, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, and Gath, the fifth major city of Philistia. Uh, Gath isn't mentioned, but the other four are. It could be that, that Judah had already captured it, as it says in Second Chronicles. But uh, Gaza, or Gaza, as in the Gaza Strip, you know, as in the, Occup or, uh, the, the um, Palestinian area, um, Gaza was a center for slave trading. Remember, the Philistines were uh, descendants of the, the Phoenician people, which were part of Tyre and Sidon. They were mariners. They came in. And, and a lot of people think that the Palestinians are Philistines. And uh, most Bible scholars don't say that's a, a new kind of thing that, that's going around. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the only people that purport that are trying to make a case for the Palestinians belonging in the land. They don't like Israel being there. But we won't discuss politics tonight. But these people were mariners, and they were known for their, their trading. And what they started trading in is in humans. And, and the city, uh, Gaza, would raid surrounding people weaker in defense and deport the whole country into slavery simply for financial gain. It was acceptable in the ancient world that if there was a war or if you were impoverished that you could be an indentured servant and, and you could actually work and get out of it. But, but that slowly changed into actually the ownership of people without them having anything to do with it and it became a financial gain and slavery became a merchandising in souls and it says in the book of Revelation that slavery is going to return, as well as drug addiction. Did you see what, what passed in California? The legalization of marijuana. I mean, that's just the first step of the drugging of our nation. And I know it's for medicinal benefits, but alcohol is for medicinal benefits too, and look how rampant that is. And it says, and this is, the book of Revelation says, in the last times, the characteristic of the planet is that people are worshiping demons, they're worshiping idols, they are involved in slavery, and they are totally enmeshed in pharmakeia. That's the Greek word for drugs. That's exactly where our world's headed. The drugs are right on there, the occult is on the bloom, and, and slavery is right around the corner. And I'm not sure what form it will take, but it's the, the, the selling of souls. And so because 
of this. God says, I take note of cruelty. Verse 6, because they deported an entire population to deliver it up to Edom. Verse 7, I will send fire on the walls of Gaza. Well, third nation is Tyre. That's in 9 and 10. And God says, I see here that they are very dishonest. It says in verse 9, in the middle, they delivered up an entire population to Edom, and they didn't remember the covenant of brotherhood. They weren't loyal to a promise they made. They had, there, there obviously had been a promise made, and they broke it. Now listen, the transgression of delivering up this people, it's, it's not described who the people are, but the brotherly covenant referred to could have been the one between King Hiram and David, or Hiram and Solomon or Hiram and Ahab. It was a protective covenant between the participants, and the action of Tyre was totally unprovoked. No king in Israel had, had attacked the Phoenicians. The result of Tyre's sin would be the total, look what it says, the total destruction. Um, I will send fire, verse 10, on the walls of Tyre, and it will consume her citadels. Listen to this. This prophecy was fulfilled when Alexander the Great destroyed Tyre in 332 B.C. after a seven-month siege. History records that 6,000 were killed in the siege and 30,000 were sold into slavery and they utterly destroyed the town. God says, you can't get away from my judgment. The fourth nation is Edom. Edom showed no compassion on Israel and tore her apart, verse 11. Edom kept his wrath forever, verse 11. He continually kept it stirred up. Uh, and God says, because of that, uh, you're going to be a desolate wasteland. And that happened in the 5th century B.C. when the Nabataeans, an Arabian tribe, totally wiped out Edom. And that's where Petra is. That was their fortress. And we're going to see that next time. Uh, verse 13, the fifth nation denounced is Ammon. Uh, that was the descendant of Lot through his younger daughter in Genesis 19. Uh, that was an incestuous union that produced uh, the Ammonites. And the Ammonites ripped open pregnant woman during their, their border raids. That was their mark. And uh, they tried to do that to destroy the population. And they did that because they wanted to increase, verse 13, their land holdings. And their detestable sin would be punished by the burning of their capital. And this prophecy was fulfilled by Tilgath Pileser, the third of Assyria. He destroyed the Ammonites in 734 B.C. Isn't that amazing? God says, hey, you're violent, and that was their problem. They were violent, and, and uh, the Edomites were vengeful. They, they never lost their anger. And, and God says, I, I'm going to destroy you. Now, chapter 2, there was uh, the disrespectful Moabites, and that's the sixth nation. This was Lot's other incestuous child through his older daughter in Genesis 19. And the Moabites had committed the despicable crime of digging up the bones of Edom's king and burning them to lime. This event was so repulsive, uh, it was so disrespectful that God says that Moab will be destroyed. And uh, according to history, Moab ceased to be a power and they are no longer recorded and their doom was just as God had said. Then Judah, in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, is also spoken against. The Lord said, for four or three transgressions of Judah and for four in two four, I will not revoke its punishment because they rejected the law of the Lord. These other people are ripping up people and, and vengeful and everything, but these people were just disobedient. Just? God looks at religious people that know the truth and are disobedient. God looks on them as the same par as people that are murderous. God says there's no... There's no um, limiting of my holiness i expect obedience and because of judah's disobedience god says that they uh, are going to pay for it and and they did pay for it he says i will send fire on judah and it will consume the citadels of jerusalem and that's exactly what nebuchadnezzar did in 586 bc destroyed him finally the lord speaks in verse six the the eighth uh, nation to be announced is the northern kingdom israel and Amos got their attention, and now he delivers to the northern kingdom a stinging denunciation. And the first thing he says is, in verse 6, he says that they, there is social injustice. He says, you are selling the righteous for silver. It was illegal to sell people into slavery who couldn't pay their debts. It was illegal in Israel, according to Exodus 21 and, and Leviticus 25. But the poor had been sold, look at verse 6, for a pair of shoes. That's almost nothing. Nothing. 
These cruel creditors were panting after the dust, verse 7, for these people. And so because of the social injustice, God says, you're going to be facing God's wrath. Secondly, it says in verse 7 that there was sexual impurity. A man and his father will go into the same maid. This speaks of total profligate immorality. Thirdly, there was spiritual idolatry. It says that they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by the altar in verse 8. And basically, uh, the rule was this. If you took someone's coat and pledge, kind of like, you know, you rent a car and you leave your credit card. Or uh, I remember we got a stroller uh, at Sturbridge Village once and they asked for my driver's license because they knew I had to come back to get that. And they would hold that as, as pledge. Well, in the biblical times, you could give your coat. And most poor people only had one coat and what they were wearing. So you gave your only coat during the day as a pledge because at night you slept in it. The poor people often would sleep. Do you remember Naomi curled up at at Boaz's feet and he lifted, he says, you know, you can lift up the corner of my coat and sleep under the corner of it. It was this big robe and he was offering a little protection to her. Most poor people just covered up in the fields when they were out working in their coat and they slept out there. So they needed it at night. And what this says is that these rich people that took it as a pledge wouldn't give them back. They took him in the temple. And and there's an overtone here, laying on the coat speaks even of immorality going on there in the temple with these pledged coats. And so it's so, I mean, it's so profane that that they would, in the presence of God, in the the, uh, holy place, take these coats and pledge, not return to the poor people who at sundown were freezing to death and didn't have anything to do. And on top of that, they would lay on top of them and perhaps even do other things. But finally, there was selfish ingratitude in verse 9. And he says, you know what? You've forgotten. It was I who destroyed the Amorite. He says, you're so ungrateful. You forgot me. He says, God protected you. You're forgetting it. Verse 10, God delivered you. I'm the one that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Verse 11, I'm the one that revealed myself through the prophets. He says, says, you're so lacking in gratitude. He said, it's terrible. Well, A number of lessons we could learn from this. Number one, God is overly patient with nations. He gives them time to repent before judgment falls. And not just with nations, with individuals. He's so patient with us, isn't he? Isn't he patient with you? He's patient with me. You know what the Psalms say? If God should mark iniquity, who would stand? No one. God's patient. Secondly, God has no respect of nations. All will be judged for their sin. God does not overlook just because one nation's, you know, this or that, all are going to be judged. His timing is different, but God is no respecter of persons, James said, or of nations. Thirdly, when the cup of sin of a nation is full, the judgment will be irrevocable. It won't. It just can't. Can't be turned back. And finally, God is sovereign over the nations. He chooses the time when they rise and they fall. And he said that they're going to be accountable for their brutal abuse that has been shown toward those who are helpless. And God's standard for judging the nation might be similar, but the results will differ. And finally, God will bring judgment on leaders who perpetrate fraud, oppression, and violence. Well, uh, just for you to kind of know what this book is about, so when you read it, there are eight prophecies. We just went through them. There are three successive sermons And uh, uh, the sermon, the first sermon is a pronouncement of judgment. The second sermon exposes their crimes. And the final sermon lists their sins. I mean, God doesn't cut any corners. He tells them exactly what they did wrong. And then what's neat is there are five promises in chapter 9. And uh, God just tells them that uh, I will give to you a hope, a land. I will fulfill my word. And you can read that in chapter 9. The people were judged in, in Damascus was was judged for cruelty, that was human rights violations. Letter B, slave trafficking for gays, that's slavery, selling people for money. God doesn't like that. Severing a treaty, that's dishonesty, breaking promises. The sword of terror for Edom, that's vengefulness. God always says, don't be vengeful. If someone hurts you, don't hurt them back. I will recompense them. Ammon for violence. Moab for disrespectfulness. They were spiteful to the dead. Judah for disobedience. And Israel for hard-heartedness. The purpose of uh, the judgment, God says in chapter 3, it's all about how they had ruined their relationship with him. Chapter 4, their unwillingness to repent. On the back of the last page, 
God says, I ask for your repentance. That's what chapter 5 is all about, the first half of it. God says, your rituals are so empty. That's his fourth message. And finally, the rich are indolent and lazy. Now, real quickly in this conclusion, and I included this because uh, I enjoy it so much. This is uh, a real good friend of mine. He was a staff member with me um, at one of the churches where I pastored. And then he went on to be a missionary in Iceland. And his name is Keith. And he's so neat. I like the way he describes stuff. This is, these are his words. My secretary had a problem with this. She kept trying to correct him. I said, no, no, that's the way he wrote them. Uh, he thinks differently. He's a left-brainer or something. He calls it the quick view, the closer look, the wonder why, the next move, the oh no, the prophet's cry, and the last thought. Kind of cute. Uh, but the quick view of the book is that because of the material prosperity, Israel was at ease, felt secure, and was lazily enjoying herself. However, because of pride and denial of reality and amazing arrogance, the rich people are severely oppressing the poor. What do they do? They're crushing and trampling the poor, it says in chapter 4. They're imposing heavy rents on the poor in chapter 5. Did you know God doesn't like people that heavily press rents on poor people? I, I mean, talk about something that's very uh, apropos to our day. I mean, it seems like people think anything you can get for whatever, it's your uh, privilege. They were, they were condemned by God because they lived in great houses while God's house was in disrepair. That's an interesting thought. They, they didn't let the poor people have justice. Do you know why? Lawyers were so expensive, the poor people couldn't afford them. Does it sound like today? Very similar. They accepted bribes. Does it sound like today? Chapter 5, verse 12. They sold the righteous for money. They acted like rich couch potatoes. In other words, they just sat around in indolence, and they were immoral. You know, there's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with being poor. But God says there are far more dangers of missing heaven if you're rich than if you're poor. In the closer look, beyond the economic oppression, Israel is engaged in a decaying mass of religious formalism. They drink wine in the house of God. They command prophets not to prophesy. They worship when it's convenient. They tithe every three days. They offer leaven thank offerings, which was wrong. They told everybody their free will offerings. They employed professional mourners. In chapter 5, verse 16, in other words, they weren't even really sorry for anything. They, they hired people to cry for them. They hated justice, and they couldn't wait for religious days to be over. You ever been in a time in your life you couldn't wait for church to be over? Couldn't wait for Sunday school to be over? Couldn't wait for uh, a Bible conference or prayer meeting to be over? In that time, you sense a little bit about what the nature of the religious condition of Amos' day was. Well, the wonder why, number three, God had blessed Israel with prosperity. However, Israel enjoyed the blessings more than the God who had blessed them. In other words, they were thankful for the blessing, but they forgot the blessing was attached to a person. And that's why God blesses. It reminds me of a good friend, Jim Berg, who always told the story when I was a student at Bob Jones about his grandmother. And he says when he was little in North Dakota, they had a 10,000-acre farm or ranch or whatever they have up there, and his grandparents owned it, and he would... After school, he'd go running across the fields to the big farmhouse, and he says, every day, my grandmother just happened to be pulling out of the oven, fresh, hot out of the oven, super stuffed with chocolate chips, cookies. And he said, just as he got into that chair and those cookies were just about melting in his mouth, he said, a glass of cold, fresh milk was dropped in front. And he said that every day he came to his grandmother for the cookies. And he said he would eat those cookies and his grandmother would talk to him and he'd just gobble them up and, and drink that milk. And he'd say, thanks, Grandma, and leave. And he says, you know what? I used to go to my grandmother for the cookies. He said, but when I got a little older, I went to my grandmother for my grandmother. You know, God sends blessings for us to come to him. But we shouldn't come to him for the blessings. He only sends the blessings for us to come to him. Don't just be content with the cookies. Talk to grandmother. And, and that's something that the Jews had never learned. The next move, God loved him. He had to warn him and judge him. The oh no, they refused. And God says, um, if you aren't willing to give up your sin, you'll face doom. There's a good question here. Is there anything that you're not willing to give up to follow God? Is there anything we want to hide from him? The prophets cry, prepare to meet God. And the last thought is the best. God created all things. He knows all things. He controls all things. He's above all things. He has a name above all names. 
it is this God who will restore Israel and once again bless them. And the wonder is, God is so concerned with us that we ought to show attention for him and worship our creator. What a good book this book of Amos is. I hope that you will be as blessed as I was as you have time to reflect on this. But prepare to meet your God. And when he sends you cookies, don't just eat the cookies and run, but pause and worship.